Tonight, <coughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about love, particularly the flows and expressions, the giving and receiving of love in in our life, in our relationships, in our friendships and relationships with lovers, etc. So, I think it's clear that this is an area that for most human beings is, is of great importance. Uh, we can have a lot of pain and bafflement as well, confusion in this area. And I think it's fair to say that most human beings need to love and need also to feel loved. <clears throat> now sometimes one doesn't admit that to oneself or one isn't conscious of that. And I would say that's true. And I want to just explore some aspects of this and obviously it's absolutely immense and more than one can bite off and chew in one talk but I just want to offer something so the need to love and the need to feel loved sometimes the need to feel loved can be out of balance in, in our life, in our life in, in someone's life so much so that it can become one of the driving forces, if not the driving need in, in the life. So I remember being at a memorial service for, for a friend who died last year sometime. And his wife, people were saying different things and memories, and his wife said something... And it just stuck with me and she said, he just so needed to feel loved. And it was kind of a, almost a bit of a summation of his life. And I wonder how, how commonly and how strongly that current runs through uh, us as human beings. And when it's balanced and when it's not balanced. And there was an article I read by a, an American biochemist, I think, and he had won a Nobel Prize for his research. And he was reflecting on his journey and how he had been an honor student and this and that and won this prize and that prize. And he said, eventually, you know, you win the Nobel Prize. And he said, and then you realize all along what you were really looking for was love. Now, I'm actually sure that wasn't the whole story, but there's something quite strong going on there how much of what we do in our life and, and in our work, etc., how much of it is governed, again, consciously or unconsciously, by the urge to look good, or at least not look too bad, to look okay, so that we will not feel unloved. There's so much revolving around this. And a friend was telling me, that she's conscious of this need and when she's in a partnership in a, in a relationship with a boyfriend that she feels loved in the relationship and then the relationship ends either person ends it and she's seen this pattern either person ends it and then she no longer feels loved and it's like going back to square one and then kind of has to look for another relationship to feel loved and is burdening that meeting, that situation by the need to feel loved. And we can reflect and look back for ourselves and another person and think, I see the roots of that in early childhood. I see with the family situation, etc. And yes, of course, there, there is something there and there's something very influential and powerful about that. But I don't think it's the whole story. It can't be the whole story. And there are people who grew up in environments where there wasn't actually that much love and somehow their life 
didn't turn out burdened by this, or overburdened, over unbalanced by this need to feel loved. And so there are always more factors, and in Dharma understanding there's always not just one cause, there's always a web of conditions that feed something, both from the past, yes, and from the present, and that feeds in anything that comes up. So, in a way, I want to talk about all, all different kinds of relationships a little bit. Well, when, or rather, if that need to feel loved is kind of dropped into the, I don't know what you'd call it, the sort of whirlpool of, of modern culture, where there's, I think it's fair to say, such a hype around romantic love, what happens when those two things meet? So, our need, a need to feel loved, can actually feed this hype that is around in, in society nowadays about of romantic love. And the hype can actually feed the need. and They work both ways. And sometimes it almost seems, and people have said this to me, almost as if romantic love has become the god of, of our present culture. In a secular culture, what has become God? What has become the most kind of important thing, in a way? And that hype, or whatever you want to call it, puts a tremendous pressure, or can put a tremendous pressure, on then that kind of intimate relationship. It burdens it, it overburdens it with too much expectation of too much fulfillment or too much whatever. And there's, a, there's a kind of distortion going on there. And I have friends, and I know, there's a kind of, it's very hard not to believe that if we don't have that kind of relationship, too many double negatives, that if, <laughs> if we don't have that kind of relationship, we, we will be unhappy. That not to have, not to be in a romantic relationship necessarily means that one's unfulfilled and unhappy. And I've seen friends of mine actually plunge into unhappiness and been thinking, now, is that actually because they don't have the relationship, because they think that they need it to be happy? And there's, it's just the momentum of belief, and one ends up feeling unhappy, because one f- doesn't have what one thinks one needs to be happy. So, so this again, like, like so much in the Dharma, is, is about questioning. Can we bring a que- questioning to this? And sometimes we, in or out of relationship, and there can be a, success or failure kind of judgment that goes with it. And if one isn't, or one hasn't been in a relationship for a while, one's kind of feels a bit like a social failure. Some years ago, I, I was at a, a Dharma talk by a monk in, in America, and he said, I'd, ne- I'd never realized this before, that the ideal that we now sort of roughly, commonly share about an intimate relationship is actually relatively new in human history. It's, I mean, we, we kind of were, bo- all of us in this room were kind of born into that and sort of took that on. But r- relatively speaking, it's quite new. It had its origins, I think, in the Renaissance period with the troubadours, these sort of wandering minstrels that would go around serenading uh, people. <laughs> and I wonder I don't know enough about Asian culture but I wonder if what's been hyped up here is, is the same now in Asian culture and it probably is with globalization and all that and you've got Hollywood and how that hypes up romantic love and Bollywood as far as I can tell is pretty close on its heels but <coughs> relatively speaking it's a, it's a relatively new ideal which somehow we've, we've just taken for granted as the given and the ideal. And if any of you know Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet, a beautiful little volume, and he, he, he's, this is, was written, I think, 1903 and 04, and he speaks then in, in a sort of optimistic way of what the future might bring in terms of relationships between two people and the equal flow, particularly between a man and a woman, etc. And... Very, very beautiful, and points to the beauty of that. But he's speaking in the beginning of the of the twentieth century as a as a possibility, 
which later come really the 60s, the 70s, etc., began to be realized more and more or drawn close to. And so there's all the beauty of that, but being realistic about this, and in, in a, if one is in, in that kind of relationship, what, what a, not just beauty, you know, a lot of hard work, really. And one puts up with, one goes through anger, irritation, doubt, Boredom, all of that is, is actually part of it. It's natural to hype it too much and, and to neglect that that can be sometimes the reality and the challenges that we face is, is foolish, I think. So there is this cultural current that kind of we're, all, we're being fed by it and everyone's kind of agreeing with each other to a certain extent about the importance of that. And it's, it's just feeding each other and we're kind of rolling along with this and being rolled along by it. A lot of things are feeding that. One of the things is that, or one of the things can be, that the, uh, to feed our need, that the less perhaps intimate we are in other ways, the less intimacy we feel, say, with friends, or with sangha, with community, or with nature, the more this one person romantic ideal, the more intense the need and the hype is placed there. And there, there feels inside more need for that particular kind of romantic intimacy. So not at all to put that down, but just to see the kind of what's feeding our perception of all that and our assumptions and our beliefs and our expectations of all that. So whatever our kind whatever relationship kind of relationship we're talking about it's it's become a kind of platitude or a kind of truism to say to to love well we need to love ourselves you need to love yourself and to feel loved you need to love yourself and that's become so common in these kind of circles that it's almost meaningless but i want to just go go into it a little bit and so often what we run into and what I run into with people is, is a lack of self-love that the self-love is not really nurtured and developed so strongly it's really strikingly common and one of the manifestations of that can be the inner critic you know, just this kind of stream of harshness and judgmentalism towards oneself and could actually give a whole talk just about that but I just want to say a, a few things so the inner critic just judging, judging what we're doing or not doing. And in a way, to work with this skillfully, I think, needs two aspects. One is a kind of heart aspect, and approaching it with heartfulness. And another is the kind of cognitive aspect, and both are important. So cognitively, we can turn around to this inner critic sometimes, and it's, this isn't good enough, and that's not good enough, and you didn't do this right, and da-da-da-da-da. And we can ask it, what would satisfy you? Just turn around and point the finger at it and say, what would satisfy you? Would you ever be satisfied? <laughs> you can see it in, in meditation. You know, Whatever we do is somehow not good enough. It can always be better. And just turn around and say, would you ever be satisfied? And then the immediate response might be yes. And then just hang in there and say, Really? <laughs> Really? Basically, I think what we'll find with the inner critic is it's, it's a non-rational voice that it doesn't, it's, it's rubbish. It doesn't make sense. And there is a way to kind of cognitively undermine it as, as much as from the heart. Then we have in this tradition the lovely, lovely practice of loving kindness, of metta, and developing that well-wishing, that deep friendliness towards oneself and towards others. And to you know, immense power in that practice and potential in that practice. And slowly over time, offering a loving kindness towards oneself, one literally reconditions the mind and the heart. One reconditions and the mind, the heart, in a, at one level, a kind of uh, stuck record of habits. Most of them not that helpful. And one's taking the needle 
off where it's stuck and putting it down somewhere else in a way that's more helpful. It's reconditioning. It's not a very glamorous or sexy sounding image, but there's, there's immense power in it. And that can take different forms. So for some people, it's tuning into Kuan Yin, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, or Jesus, someone who embodies compassion. You see these bumper stickers, Jesus loves me, or Jesus loves you. And, you know, initial reaction can be, well, that's just, you know, it's silly or whatever, it's just rubbish, I don't think, that kind of thing. But I don't know if it's, if it's necessarily a kind of immature practice. I think, I've, I've known people, and actually for myself in the past, there's, it's a practice that can it's a way into loving kindness to actually tune into a love that we're receiving through devotion. And it goes on its own journey, unfolds to its own depths. So not to dismiss that as a possibility. Sometimes with the inner critic, we actually feel the pain of it, this judgment, this, this, this. And, and we feel the sting of that in the heart. And then just with, I guess still with the loving kindness practice, in a way being with that pain, being with the pain of it, and just holding that pain in love, just bathing it in love, immensely healing. Healing that happens over time, over time. And sometimes we need someone else. It's not that we can fix everything just sitting you know, on our backsides ourselves. And we need someone that we love and respect to say, I respect you, I respect you. And that can make the difference. We get it from outside. I think we also need to, and this is very interesting, to love and respect ourselves for the right things. We touched on this, I think, in yesterday's question-answer period. Are we respecting ourselves for our commitment to ethics, for our generosity, for our aspirations towards what's beautiful. This is, this is really, really important. It's so easy because, I think again, partly because of the culture and the kind of criterion for evaluation that, that exists in the culture, to slip from that. So easy. And we can be seduced into not appreciating ourselves or using the wrong criteria, using the wrong criteria. How successful we are at this or that, how much money we make, this, you know, what we look like. The Buddha said something very powerful. He said, you can search the entire universe for someone more deserving of loving kindness than yourself. And you will not find that person. It's very powerful. In a way, he's pointed a whole other level. It has nothing to do with what you think of yourself or what you think you deserve or don't deserve. Your beingness grants you the, the deserving of loving kindness. And sometimes there's another aspect that's quite interesting. Sometimes others criticize us or get angry with us for something or because of something. And maybe this begins in childhood and a child being too... This happens in childhood and parents get angry with us or whatever. And we're too young to really understand what's going on. And we take it as a statement and a conclusion about our essence. And it's actually a statement about our action. When you shouldn't do that or don't do that or when you do that it, it makes me angry now, the thing is we can one of the things is we can keep that pattern of making conclusions about our essence it keeps going through adulthood so even when people are communicating skillfully about our actions we keep concluding about our essence I am a bad person sometimes we know this intellectually and it still happens still happens some of it has to do with unskillful communication and people being angry and not communicating skillfully that is about an action. One of the 
really quiet but most significant shift in dharma is that we move from essence to action so what's important in dharma is our actions on on all levels and not it's not about essence and that that's a shift that brings a lot of well incredible amount of freedom and again it doesn't sound very dramatic So I, I feel we need to love our own love. So I mean, if we look at our life, there are instances and there are areas where we really love, whether it's loving nature or loving a pet or loving the truth. We need to actually love and see the beauty of our own love. Loving our own curiosity. There's something very important and precious I think about that to love and cherish even one's own longing for intimacy so as as lay people we are interested in this and I think it's important that we see that in ourselves and really recognize the beauty of our own longing for intimacy emotional and sexual because sometimes we can even ignore the fact that we want it and we just kind of go through life pretending we don't want it. Or we feel it very strongly. A person feels this, this longing for intimacy very strongly and very deeply. And something else, we can assume that the very strength of it means something, something's wrong with me. I want it so much. I feel such a deep longing for it. And we think, What's wrong with me? What am I assuming it means about me if my desire for intimacy is is really deep? There's a really deep longing. Again, like many things, some of these assumptions are often not fully conscious. If I were more together, if I were more spiritual, if I were more evolved, if I was less damaged, I wouldn't feel this intensity, this need, this longing so much. Are those kind of thoughts there? Maybe, maybe much of our longing or part of it is actually something very beautiful and very natural to kind of who we are and how we are, part of our our juiciness. And as well as that, it dependently arises because of past conditions and again because of present conditions. And both, both are there. So we look at our life and our relationships and and the the, the flow of of love or the absence of love in our life and we need to ask, am I or how am I blocking love and intimacy in my life? Is there shame around sexuality, for instance? What what havoc this wreaks. Complete havoc when there's shame around sexuality. What pain there is in that and what ends up coming out of that. The pressure on the being. Is there shame around sexuality and sexual longing, sexual desire? Is there shame around our emotional need for intimacy? We... I think that this cherishing really needs to be there, that we see the beauty of that in ourselves, the preciousness of that in ourselves, and we really cherish it. If it's not there, or rather when it's not there, then when we enter into a situation where we're meeting someone and there's potential intimacy, we're actually burdening that meeting, burdening that potential intimacy, by needing the other to kind of accept something about ourselves that we don't accept. Now sometimes this works and we kind of get away with it. (laughs) Sometimes, I've seen it happen. But generally speaking, it backfires. When, When we're not cherishing, when we're not really accepting that part, there will be fear and and the vulnerability of that part being exposed. Of course there will. Not only that, because we're not cherishing that very deep, very um, tender part of ourselves, 
in a way, then we're also less intimate with ourselves. We're, we're not in contact with that. And that lack of intimacy with ourselves gives more intensity to the need for intimacy with another. And so you get this kind of vicious cycle. Sometimes we might be relatively okay with something in ourselves, but really unsure if we can bring that into relationship, whether it's friendship or or a lover or whatever. And something feels unacceptable. We assume that it's unacceptable in the territory of relating. So, for example, crying or, or, or something like that. And with, when I'm with another, it's not okay to cry. Somehow it's not accepted. And again, the roots can be because of the upbringing, because of the family, because of the education system, etc., the peer, peer pressure when we were young. One of the beautiful things about human relationships is this is the kind of thing that can really be healed. And we see that when we bring something that we assumed was unacceptable, can be that we're met, whether it's by a friend or a lover or a, a teacher or a therapist or whatever, and actually met and they can handle it and it is okay. And maybe they even really appreciate it. That they appreciate our tears or, or whatever it is. They appreciate that, that depth of feeling, that honesty, that vulnerability. And regard it as a gift. And in that, and in the seeing of that, that the other, it's okay with the other and the other appreciates it, there's healing there. There's healing. So again, it's not all coming from me and my work that I do on the cushion, etc. Sometimes we find ourselves in, in a situation, in a relationship with one or, or more people, and there's a possibility of some intimacy, of some real connection and, and flow of communication and feeling. And we find ourselves shutting it off without realizing it. It's barely conscious the way we just shut off, we close the door. And we might find ourselves, someone was telling me in a sort of, there was a group sort of sharing and discussion uh, situation and they were, they were telling me, they, w- they were noticing someone was about to speak and, and just the thought, oh I know what they're like, I know what they're going to say, I know what they <laughs> think. I know, I know where they're coming from. And this can happen in groups, it can also happen one-on-one, especially where one has a history, a, a long-term partnership, and one knows that, that person, one feels that. It can become a little still, I know, I know what they're going to say and where they're coming from. And in that moment when we do that, when that is carried through, and we do shut down because we just turn off a little bit, lose interest. In that moment we're not meeting and receiving a person, another person. There isn't the intimacy then. Or the same person said she was noticing in in the same situation she felt she wanted to express something and then she thought, well, my opinion isn't worth much compared to others. And it's this self-depreciation and what happens, we block the self-expression. And again, we're shutting off the intimacy. We shut off the intimacy and what happens, the inner kind of feelings of intensely needing it increase. And get, it gets more intense. There's, there's another area in, in the way we kind of can block the flow of love and intimacy. And someone was sharing this with me a while ago. And it has to do with feelings and the feeling of love and the way we usually regard love as a feeling. And we relate to love as a feeling, understandably. But actually love is much more than a feeling. And he was saying how he noticed situations where feelings had much more authority than intentions. And he gave tremendous priority to his feelings in a situation rather than the intentions. So he was saying he didn't hug 
friends or whatever it was, when, when he didn't feel like it. And he thought for a long time that this was being true to himself, being more real. Why should I hug when I don't feel like it? It feels untrue. I feel like I'm, I want to be in my honesty and my integrity. And I, I'm doing something which is not it's acting as if something was there that's not there. Why do we give feelings oftentimes more priority than our intentions to love? This is, I think this is very interesting. Sometimes, and I know this is true for myself, I've seen it, we feel or have felt in our life disconnected from our feelings, disconnected from our emotional life, oftentimes for years. And if I think back, Okay. <laughs> if I think that <laughs> a long stretch of my life f- felt in hindsight disconnected from the feeling life and then working very hard in, in, in psychotherapy for a number of years felt, r- felt I managed to reconnect with the whole feeling life and open that up again and understand that again draw closer and have the, the richness and the beauty of that again re rediscover and recover that for myself and tremendous gift in that but along with that it was almost like I felt that because I had been disconnected from my feelings and then reconnected it felt like I was reclaiming myself in the reclaiming of my feelings and if there was a situation where I felt like I wasn't in touch with my feelings or I wasn't paying that much attention to my feelings, the fear was that I would lose myself again. Does that make sense? And this was operating for quite a while. It's very interesting. Why do we identify the self with feelings so much? with emotion so much. And we tend to, and that's where this this person uh, who was sharing this with me was coming from. Sometimes the actual experience of emotion is quite dense, especially when there are difficult feelings, anger or whatever, you know, I don't want to hug you because I feel angry right now, or whatever, I don't want to hug you because I need some space, or whatever. And that difficult feelings actually have a kind of density and solidity to their, the way they feel in the body, their expression. And in the very density and solidity of them, they feel more real. They literally feel more solid. And compared to that, our intentions to love feel so um, flimsy and kind of superficial or artificial. But with that, oftentimes we don't see how our feelings, our emotions are actually fabricated, are built by all kinds of conditions in the present. So the story we tell ourselves about a situation, the story we tell ourselves about our, our life and our history, how much does that feed and build our feeling and emotionality in the present? I think, I've had this history of whatever it is, uh, the way I'm looking at it in my story. And it feeds the feeling, it fabricates a feeling in the present. The self-view, what I'm, how I'm defining the self, what I'm concluding about myself, that will fabricate my feelings in a moment. What my view is of the feeling, it's great that I'm allowing this feeling, it's terrible that I have this feeling. It really means I'm a bad person. It means I'm a great person. All this is building and fabricating feelings. And it goes on below, generally speaking, below the the, the level of consciousness. We're building our feelings, fabricating them. Aversion. I don't like this feeling. It's unpleasant. It's difficult. That's actually a builder of feeling. Or identifying with a feeling. That is me. It's me. It's my real self. We can very easily believe that feelings are kind of really true. They're really true. They're a given. That's just what's happening in the moment. That is what is. 
or that they somehow are an accurate reflection of what's going on, an accurate barometer. So this is it's very rich and, and delicate area. So is love just a feeling? I think it's actually much more than that. And there's something about learning to get behind the intentionality to love. That's in a way <coughs> perhaps ends up being more significant than the feeling in in any moment. And then there's this whole kind of area, crazy area maybe, of falling in love. Falling in love. <laughs> and as I was talking with someone who was here on retreat, I can't remember when it was, maybe a month ago or so, I don't remember. And she she was in, the, in a period of falling in love and somehow miraculously found herself at Guy House for about a week in, in the middle of it. And she was sort of sitting here with a lot of these feelings and just saying, it, it's just this. It seems like this swinging, beti- swinging between clinging and fear, and between clinging and fleeing, between clinging and grasping, and fear of hurt, and and <laughs> fear of rejection. And it just seems to be flip flopping back and forth, and and that's what sort of falling in love is all about, kind of thing. And we were talking. It was. Can we really, really know, deep down, a heartfelt way, can we really know that we are okay, that we will be okay, that we can be happy whatever happens, whatever the outcome of this relationship of falling in and out of love? What happens when we're really secure in that happiness inside? And this is where the aspect of the Dharma about cultivating what's lovely and what brings happiness and what brings a sort of depth of inner resource. That's where, that's so important. What happens when we are in life with a sense of a really kind of relatively stable and deep inner reservoir of of well-being, of nourishment, of, of happiness? And then we meet the conditions such as falling in love in a quite a different way. And we can stay somehow steady in that, knowing that, well, if it works out, great. If it doesn't, also great. Not a problem. <laughs> it's, it's actually there as a real possibility. That the, the, the reservoir of inner well-being can be so strong that it, it just matters much less this or that outcome. And we were talking, myself and this, this retreat, and I can't remember whether she asked or I asked it, this question, what would falling in love look like without all the delusion? What would that look like? And, and is it even possible? I, th- I actually think it is, definitely. But a friend, a good friend I have in the States, she said that, she thinks projection at the beginning of, of a romantic relationship she says without that projection and kind of seeing other people as totally wonderful and perfect and, and all, all this stuff without that level of projection most relationships would never even get off the ground <laughs> and in a way it might be a valid point it's like we need a, a certain amount of delusion to get the wheels rolling <laughs> And, you know, maybe that's just okay and it's just part of maturing in the relationship and maturing in love to, to learn to see through that. And, oh, look, you're <laughs> it's not quite what I thought. And it's okay. And then something a bit more authentic and deep begins to, to get welded there and, and cemented. In, in situations of falling in love, but even in friendships or, or other kind of relationships... So often uh, we hear, or I hear, or, or a person says, I feel vulnerable, I feel so vulnerable. And we can feel very vulnerable with another human being, with other human beings. And it's such an interesting word, this word vulnerability and feeling vulnerable. Such an interesting word to me. And it's, it's so common, and it's such a, 
strong and palpable sense. And again, it's one of these feelings that has a tremendous amount of power in our lives. This feeling of vulnerability has an immense amount of power. But do we ever really explore it? And what does it really mean when, when I say, when you say, I feel vulnerable, or I might feel vulnerable? What does it really mean? Vulnerable to what? Vulnerable to what exactly? What does it mean? To hurt? To ridicule? That someone makes fun of, of something that we expose? To rejection? To abandonment? feel vulnerable to being abandoned and to feeling abandoned, to misunderstanding. What does it actually mean? What are we vulnerable to? What are we feeling vulnerable to? And then a question with that, a question with that. Can we really be hurt in the way that we believe we can? It's not, it's not an easy question, but can we really be hurt in the way that we believe we can? Actually, this same woman that I was talking to was on retreat and falling in love, and, and she was saying sometimes this, this fear of rejection feels like a death fear. It's so strong. It feels like a fear of death. What is the mind cementing and compounding and, and making into something and then believing in. And oftentimes without us being fully aware of that process, something can be so strong in consciousness and so solidified. What have we cemented in terms of what we, the way we believe we can be hurt and the depth to which we believe we can be hurt? What, what's going on there? So I, I think we, we need to unpack this. We, we, it, I don't think it's easy, but we need to usually slowly in our lives unpack this. Sometimes it happens quite quickly, but we need to unpack this question of vulnerability, fear of rejection, etc. Another question. What is rejection? So one of, one of, the, say one of the main fears that people can often have, either in romantic coming together or, or, or with friendships or, or any kind of social situation is a fear of rejection. And sometimes to turn around and say, what is rejection? What does that actually mean? Again, or is that, is that really a kind of concept that I've built up and it has got this enormous emotional charge to it? And almost, almost untouchable. So I remember another person that I was talking to, she was talking about the context both of romantic relationships and friendships and talking about this fear of rejection. And interestingly for her, she couldn't even go near yet the question, what actually is rejection? What is it? There wasn't, I felt, enough of that reservoir yet of well-being that developed, developed through practice over time too raw, too painful, too threatening. There wasn't enough of a sense of inner balance to really approach this question, what is rejection? And just really kind of look at that in a, in a very bold and, and open way. She, she wasn't yet able, and that was fine, that's okay, and you can come back to it. But it, in a way to ask a question like that, so loaded and can be so difficult, actually takes a lot of inner strength. And again, that's where the practice comes in. It's part of what practice is about. To be able to ask that in a, in a really meaningful way, in a way that actually begins to disentangle it, unentangle that. Because at one level, basically that's what's happened. A concept of rejection, it doesn't feel intellectual, it doesn't feel like a concept, but a concept of rejection has become entangled emotionally, etc., and, and it's there, it needs unentangling. And so with this, you know, we need to respect where we are, and respect when we have fear, and we need to go slowly in opening up to people, and letting people in, 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 in a relationship. We need to actually respect that, but also to play with our edges. So similarly, Two people have been together, say, in a romantic relationship, and there's a breakup, there's a split up, as you know, very, obviously very common. 
and how often that gets interpreted as a rejection. One or even sometimes both parties feel it as a rejection. And sometimes we even know it doesn't make sense and yet some, something in us is interpreting it that way. Or even more, interpreting it as we feel unlovable. Because this person has rejected us, I feel unlovable. One way of seeing, we were talking the question answers today, ways of looking that bring freedom, practicing ways of looking that bring freedom. What would it be to look again at the relationship and just, and just see, it wasn't about rejection, it wasn't that I was unlovable, the conditions weren't there at the time, the conditions weren't there. And so it it couldn't blossom, it could not flower. Conditions when it's a very different way of looking. Or, at that time we lacked the skill in relationship, we lacked the skill in relationship. And the Buddha talks a lot about this word skill. And in a way, (coughs) relationship is also skill. Sustaining relationship is also skill. And at that time we just lacked it. It's possible that I or we can develop that skill, but right then we just lacked it. We, we didn't have it. So very different seeing it that way. Can we turn the perception around, turn the view around? Sometimes the fear in terms of well, particularly romantic relationships is actually the opposite. It's a fear of being trapped. That's the sort of other other end of the spectrum. A person feels, whoa, you know. And and again, we need to question this. Not easy. It's this this is not easy at all. Is is there really such a thing as being trapped? And what does it mean? Trapped? I won't be able to do what? Explore a lot of different other partners. Is that what it means? And is that really so bad? <laughs> what does it mean? Interesting, our life is, is made of forms at one level. We, we move in forms of relationships or partnerships or jobs or this, this or that situation. Sit, situations of forms. And, and in a way, Dharma practice is moving towards seeing through form, seeing the emptiness of form, feeling free within form. So, you know, one of the reasons we walk up and down and up and down in walking meditation or round in circles is because it's a contained form. And eventually one sees through that and sees, feels a freedom within a form. The form is not imprisoning. Not, not easy. So certainly, if we can let go of all that and the fear goes out of, of that in relationship, does that mean the beauty goes out? No, not at all. And then, you know, one is in maybe a romantic relationship. You know, one has gone through that period of falling in love and then one's in it. And what does it take to maintain and sustain and and keep nourishing and nurturing that kind of relationship? Or a friendship, what does it take to maintain a friendship? And again, I, I, I really feel it's a skill as much as anything. It's a skill. And one can develop that. There was a survey a while ago that I came across and it said it was surveying couples who felt they were really happily married after a long time or happily in a couple after a long time. And what they, almost unanimously they, they said was that, you know, I actually see that to, to have sustained that and to have kept it going, it could have been quite a number of people rather than it's this myth that we can sometimes have of the one, I need to find the one. Actually, it's a skill, and there's quite a few people that I could probably sustain that with. There was another survey that was in in last Sunday's Observer, and it was a survey of 2,000 adults, so I'm guessing representing 4,000 married couples. more than half reported unhappy in their marriage. More than half. Two-thirds of wives revealed they would divorce immediately were their economic security assured. 
half of husbands considered their marriage loveless. 30% of those questioned were lingering in doomed marriages to avoid upheaval. <laughs> you know, what's, what's going on here? What's going on? There's, on one hand, there's this tremendous hype in the culture, tremendous hype, and on the other, you know, and I don't know who they surveyed, etc., but there is the, the realization that actually it's very difficult. The reality is it's very difficult to really maintain and sustain it well. It's very difficult. We could ask, what is actually the purpose of a, a romantic partnership or relationship like that? Are two people really supporting each other in growing? Is that really what's going on? Is that perhaps what might be the most beautiful purpose of a coming together? There's really a mutuality of supporting. Supporting each other to grow in, in, in lovely and beautiful and, and profound ways. Is that actually what's going on? Or is there a kind of mutual support in fear and dependency? Fear of for myself and for the other. Now, oftentimes what, there's actually a mix going on. But this isn't, again, this is not easy to look at this. It's not easy to really turn around and say, and look at, look at what one wants and look at one's relationships and say, is, is that really what's going on there? Can that be what's going on? Oftentimes in, in a partnership, you know, you hear someone say, I feel like I lost myself or I lose myself in this relationship or I'm losing myself. And so it's a certain kind of language and it obviously doesn't sound very... Dharmic, but what does it really mean? It means, I feel it means losing touch with one's needs, losing touch with one's desires, losing touch with one's feelings, losing touch with one's authenticity. And sometimes that can happen for hours, and sometimes people report it happens for decades. It's decades that one person or even both people has actually lost lost themselves in a marriage or a relationship. Why does that happen? What is happening? Why does that happen? How does that happen? I was teaching just a brief visit somewhere else last I think it was last week and talking with someone who again was taking a little time away from their relationship and their being away for I think a week brought up a lot of fear in their partner. And she was saying, I don't want to hurt him by, you know, by just going ahead and taking time away, etc., etc. And it, it, to really bring an honesty of questioning, is that really the true intention, that I don't want to hurt another? And we were exploring this a little bit. Or is it that perhaps I don't want to be seen as the one who is hurting? Or I don't want to see myself as the one who is hurting? Or more commonly, maybe if I do this or go away or ask for this or whatever, take this, maybe I'll lose them. And how much is, is that kind of fear and mutuality of fear being reinforced in the relationship? So Dharma practice, at you know, you know sort of very broad summary of what it might be, is cu- you know cultivating inner resources really over time, gradually, with the development of you know all these lists: generosity and loving kindness and compassion and equanimity and mindfulness and uh, calmness, etc. Concentration, developing all that, one really develops the inner resources. And out of that, a sense of well-being that's more steady, a sense of happiness that's more steady in our life. And that gives, gives one, allows one an honesty in life, and an honesty in one's relationships, and allows one a fearlessness in one's relationships. Can, can you see how that works? One doesn't feel so dependent. What if I lose them? What if this? What if that? Because one feels more stable in oneself. 
It's a gradual process. So on one hand, Dharma practice is cultivating what's um, what's beautiful and what leads to inner resource. And on the other hand, or alongside with that, it's investigating, investigating. And the awareness we're developing here and the mindfulness and the attentiveness allows a kind of subtlety of seeing and more and more subtlety of seeing. So we begin to see in our life the subtle kind of intentions operating and that, that run through our relationships, if we're honest, if we're really honest. All kinds of subtle intentions running through and it's the development of awareness that allows us to see them, allows us to see what is subtle and what would otherwise be hidden. And it's the cultivation of the inner resources that gives us a kind of, allows a kind of honesty and fearlessness with that. Often, in, again, in uh, particularly romantic relationships or marriages or, or partnerships or whatever, one of the most common dynamics, and it, it's really quite a painful one, it can be really quite a painful one, is one person wants a lot more space and the other person is in the role of being, I need more contact, I'm needy, needy. And either it stays in that sort of thing or sometimes it can even flip. And there's something set up there that can be very painful to kind of dance back and forth and the more the person needs contact the more the other person wants space and the more the one person wants space the more the other person has the need for contact and the need to be close and the need to be together more and you know something like that which is so common so common is not going to go away without talking about it so we can kind of hope that it will just, you know, if we just sort of ignore it, it will go away. But it, it's not going to. And to be able to look at it and talk through it honestly together is, is really nourishing the relationship, working through something that's potentially really painful and difficult. In usually in Dharma talks and Dharma teachings, we talk much more about loving kindness and, and metta and, and that quality. And there's something about that in relation to all this that I've been talking about this evening. In the metta practice, in the loving kindness practice, we're working on giving love and we give love to ourselves and we give love to to other beings. But there's an aspect in that too of receiving love and actually feeling like you're Excuse me. One is receiving love in the meta practice, and one's giving it to oneself. One's focusing and feeling on receiving it as well. Am I open to receiving love from myself? So it's a different orientation within the loving kindness practice. When we practice giving love in the, in the loving kindness practice or in our life, and there's a, there's a giving in a wide way, and that's what metta is, it's a kind of wide giving, a boundless giving. Something happens in terms of receiving. The more we give, actually the more we find we receive. And the Buddha talked about this, just talks about, I think, it's 11 blessings or benefits that come from loving-kindness practice, from developing a really wide love. And one of them is that you're loved. People love you. They, they like you. And so eventually the giving leads to a kind of receiving. But there's something else that, that goes on there. When we give love, when, when, for instance, when we're in the metta practice, when it feels like it's sort of cooking a little bit and going quite well, you could say the heart center opens or the heart opens or the energy center is open. And we're giving love and something happens in the being. We actually feel open in this outflow of love. When the heart opens, when the energy centers open, what happens to the mind? What happens to the perception? The perception changes. 
So our perception of the world, and we were talking about emptiness in the question and answer period today, the perception changes because the heart has changed. So the way we see depends on, on the heart. The perception changes and we actually perceive more love. We perceive like love is there and it's available and we have it, we're getting it. So in the giving, something opens and the perception changes and we, we perceive more love. We perceive, we feel more loved. In some of the question and answer we were talking about self and not self and selflessness and all this and just to reiterate some of those points that both of them are important both the view and the avenue of talking in terms of selflessness and no self and not self but also the language and the view of self that that's, they're actually equally important they're both important So it's not as Dharma practitioners that we're always gravitating towards this view of selflessness and this way of relating in terms of selflessness. It's not that at all. But something happens when we're talking about letting go or loosening the self-definition and the self-view and the, the, the constriction of self-view. As we let go of the self-definition the tightness of the self-view, what happens? There's actually an opening out of the being, less separation, and a less unbalanced need to feel loved. We're less kind of out of balance in our dependency to feel loved. This is a fruit of the practice of letting go of self-definition. It brings with it an accessibility to love and less need to neediness around love less also hyped dependency on one person so metta when we talk about loving kindness is this kind of equality of love it's it's equal it flows out equally it's not just to one person but as the self you gets less defined and less tight we actually experience more love. And this is t- something to investigate in one's practice as practice deepens. It can actually open up more love the, the less self, less tight the self-view is. And the more the sense we have of receiving love in that. It's just, it's almost like there's no separation, there's no barrier. And the love is just there as something in a way pregnant in the space just filling space. The less self we have, the, le- the more we find ourselves in a, in a space, in a climate, in a universe of love. So perception and perception of love changes. It changes. And this, this, we need to be interested in this change of perception. It's, it's probably one of the most key elements of the Dharma perception and how it changes. Sometimes we find ourselves blocked to seeing love. We can't see love. It feels like we're in a loveless universe, a loveless relationship. We have no love in our life. We actually cannot see it. And sometimes for a person that seems to go on for really a long time. We find ourselves blocked. We cannot feel and see and sense love. The other end of the of the spectrum is that there's big opening and we actually perceive love everywhere everything can seem in, in a very you know, deep med- meditative space everything can seem like it's an expression of love everything it's like the whole universe is actually an expression of love and that's a very beautiful mystical experience intuition that's, that's actually available for us as meditators with you know dedication Sometimes our consciousness deepens and it deepens sort of into equanimity through love, beyond love. Or it deepens into a kind of nothingness. 
And it's like, it's not really love, it's gone beyond love, it's transcended it in some way. But in that space, there's no sense of feeling unloved or a lack of love. We've actually gone through and beyond love. Perception of love changes, can it, immense range to it, immense range. And so love depends on perception. Depends on perception, even in the most mundane way. So, you know, an ex-partner says, oh, I, I still really love you, I still really love you, I really love you, I'll always love you. And then they meet someone else. <laughs> and then, what happens? <laughs> what happens to that feeling? Dependent on their perception of feeling alone or, or not. But love, our perception of love can be less, can be a lack of love, can be more, can be infinite. We can transcend it, it can be transformed. And in the transcending and transforming, it's not cold, not nihilistic. With that, we actually see that love itself, it, it actually lacks inherent existence. It, it's not actually something. And that doesn't mean that we're rejecting love at all or that when we live in a, in a cold way or a harsh way at all. It, what it really gives us is a kind of huge spaciousness of, of really, really deep okayness with, with love in relationship to love. We're really okay in, in that realm in terms of feeling the need to be loved and the expression of love in our life in, in different ways. There's, there's space for that to be really, really okay, for it to flow both ways, for it to be there in the space as a perception that comes and goes and changes. There's an okayness with it. Okay, so shall we sit together for a bit?